Good morning and another beautiful day to you. We are continuing our journey. We have made it through Morocco. We have survived nearly falling off the sand dunes into the sea in Mauritania. And we're now at Naukachot, the capital of Mauritania, on this remote city on the western side of Africa. Now, with a visa obtained for the next country in hand, we have to cross Mauritania to get into Mali. Now, we had read up that starting in the 1970s, a road was being built right across uh, Mauritania, from the coast all the way to the inland, into the Sahel area of the desert. And the idea was that the other countries, Mali, Niger, Libya included, would continue sections of their roads that eventually would link up West Africa to East Africa with a road right across the Southern Sahara Desert. Can you imagine it? And it was joyfully dubbed the Road of Hope. Now, this was 2000, so we'd read about the Road of Hope, so we thought, this is our route. There really is only one route across um, the centre of Mauritania to get to Mali. So we stocked up, refuelled, visas for Mali in hand, and off we set onto the Road of Hope. Now, in now chop the capital, nice tar road, follow the signs, out you go. About 10 kilometers out of Naukachot, the road of hope starts to become less hopeful. In fact, it becomes a nightmare because at one point the road was completed all the way through and there still is, in those days, a road, but it hadn't been repaired for something like 20 years. And now it was a potholed, sandy, more sand than tar. And as anybody will tell you, driving on a pothole road is far slower and more dangerous than driving off-road. So the road of hope ran out of hope very, very quickly and it became very, very slow going to make our way across Mauritania. And there really is nothing there to see apart from the sheer emptiness of the beautiful desert. We spent two days doing that thousand kilometre journey, mainly because we actually drove beside the Road of Hope rather than on the Road of Hope because the tar was in such terrible condition. Most of it, you know, you were dodging lumps of tar to keep on the sand to keep the journey smooth. We bush camped on the way, we just pulled off beside the road, slept for the night, got on the next day and made our way through to Nima, which is where you do your documentation because it's the nearest town and to the border with um, Mali, which, is, which you drop into south from Nima. So we got to Nima, restocked, spent the night and then wended our way south to the border with Mali. Now... It was quite an amazing change as you go south because a lot of Mali is also in the Sahara Desert but also there's the big rivers that come up from the south of Mali as well and you come from the desert, the barren, absolutely desolate emptiness of the Sahara Desert into lush green trees and it's so amazing to see the vibrancy of life that suddenly appears because on most of the journey across Mauritania there was nobody and nothing. There is no towns. There is nothing there until you get to Nima. Um, so it was actually quite refreshing to start seeing people and villages and life again. It really is quite amazing. At, uh, and we dropped down into Bamako, the capital of Mali. Now we had to stop there for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we then had to get our visas for the next country because because our plans had changed, we literally had to go country by country in each country. We went to the embassy for the next country, applied for the visa, visited that country, picked up our visa, and then went on to the next country as best as we could, hoping we would make it all the way across. Because if not, if we didn't get a visa for the next country at some point, we had to turn around and go all the way back the same route again, which we did not want to do. But we arrived in Bamako, and we found a nice camping site on the edge of town, and we settled in and my wife Jennifer was very very happy because this is the first time I think for quite a few days that there were shower facilities, running water per se. So 
uh, while I set off the camp, she grabbed a towel to wash it and she was off to have a shower. So while I prepared her some supper with some fresh food, put the kettle on, made a fire, set up the camp, she was enjoying a shower, except she wasn't enjoying the shower because she got absolutely mauled by mosquitoes. I mean, head to toe, she had over, had over 100 mosquito bites. She has never forgotten that shower, and neither have I all the next few days when I had to apply medication to every single one of these bites and to stop her scratching. Thankfully, there was no serious side effects. She didn't get malaria at that point. She did later, but that's another story for the future. Um, but lesson learned. At, uh, quick showers, even if you haven't had one for a few days. So that was our main memory of Bamako, which is a big, busy African city, uh, very friendly, but uh, not exactly a lot going on. And we were really off the tourist trail here. Once we'd left Nauchot, coming into Mauritania, all the way through to Mali, we had not seen another tourist or foreigner at all. And in fact, when we were turning up in the landy, people were stopping and staring. Um, it was such an unusual sight. When we crossed the border from Mauritania into Mali, we were the only people at the border. That was it. We actually had to wake up the guy to stamp our things and he was like, and we had to tell him what to do because we had a carne for our vehicle to go through. Uh, so it was really quite fascinating. It was really beautiful. And Mali is an astonishing country. I'd never heard of it before. Um, we'd never planned to visit there, but when we were there, it is beautiful. And uh, one of the things we planned to do that we had heard about, that the main thing that um, Mali is famous for, is a market in Dijena. It's a, it, as you go east across the country, which is on our route across to Niger, there, it's a very famous big mosque, and every one day of the week, I think it's Saturday or Sunday of the week, um, there's a huge local market set up right in front of the mosque. And basically it is connect all the people in the area, all the different tribes who live around the area, all come into that place, trade their goods and go out again. So we made sure we were there on the Friday so we could set up, find some accommodation and then watch this thing. And it was, when we were there, absolutely nothing empty completely then the evening came on the saturday evening and we basically watched the market being built in front of our eyes you know all the stands all the stalls all built out of local material it wasn't people with trailers and things it was people coming with sticks and mud and bricks making stalls and stand putting cloth covers over them and the next day was a teeming local market and i wandered around to take some pictures, uh, we both wandered around to just enjoy and absorb the market because it is an entirely local market. I mean, there was not another tourist inside. It is nowadays apparently quite a popular tourist destination. You can fly in, enjoy the market and go away. But then it was a purely local market and you could see all the different tribes coming in with their different uh, clothing and styles and different wares to sell. And basically it's not, a, well then, it wasn't a money market. Nobody exchanged money. It was all an exchange of goods people trading what they had for what they needed and going away. It was amazing to see. Then um, big celebrations in the night, went on through the night. By the morning, gone. Everyone packed up back to their tribes and villages and it was deserted. At uh, another memorable place. And across Mali, as we travelled across, we then travelled, uh, continuing east, you go past the turning for Timbuktu. Uh, we didn't go to Timbuktu. We'd, we'd read and spoken to a few people who have been there. Basically, it's the salt mines where they used to make uh, mine salt. They still mine salt that they put on the caravans that went to the coast that used to ship to Europe and the US where original salt used to come from, proper desert salt. Um, so there's a big open cast salt mine there and pretty much nothing else on the edge of the desert. Uh, we decided it wasn't worth the diversion. But we did pass a wonderful sign that uh, I'll, I'll put up here, which basically, you know, it's a direction to Timbuktu, turn left here and go for 42 days. That was obviously by camel, but that used to be the trip from that turning. It was 42 days to get to Timbuktu, where they would take the camel trains, load them up with salt, bring them back, and then um, put them on um, transport to go to the coast and then off to Europe so we could have salt on our fish and chips. Um, but as we're making our way 
east past this turn into Timbuktu. Um, we are heading to the border with um, Niger, which I think is Gao. Gao is where we're heading to. There, it's, it's a long road. Some beautiful landscapes on there. We enjoyed, I think, two weeks taking that road because it was so amazing. There was one part where there was these houses or holes, homes, no, dwellings carved into the cliffs where they didn't know where the people, they didn't know who had dug them in, who had lived there, who had gone. Um, I forgot what the name of the people they think lived there, but they're just empty dwellings. Thousands of them dotted in the cliffs. Then uh, you wend your way and of course you're, you're basically heading, you're staying north of the river. So on the south side, you've got this verdant green beauty. On the north side, you've got the desert encroaching in. So we had some beautiful camping spots on the way. And we just basically bush camped. You just drove along, then of course, nice advantage of the Land Rover. You drove, it came to late afternoon. You took a diversion off the road. You found a track, a quiet spot amongst the rocks and cliffs. And there was all sorts of beautiful scenes around there. And uh, spent the night. And we were just sleeping on the roof of the Land Rover, under the stars, under a mosquito. It was spectacular and beautiful. Now, on one occasion, we were trundling across the section and we found this beautiful rocky outcrop with these palm trees. It was very beautiful. Sunset was coming. We thought this will make a really nice camping spot. So we, we tucked in there and camped, set up our camp. And what we didn't realise, we'd actually stay, stopped quite close to a village. And um, a lot of the people from the village came to see us. Um, some children, some adults came along and, uh, you know, sort of looking at us you know, being very friendly, sort of waving, and we're setting up camp, and we were already eating our supper, so we were like, you know, they were just standing around there, maybe 20 or 30, and watching us eat, and we're going, hello, and they're like, hello, they're very friendly, this came to watch us, I mean, out there, they didn't have TV or anything, we are the, you know, most exciting thing, different thing that happened there for years, so it, uh, that was quite interesting, and we're thinking, well, how are we going to get ready and go to bed, this is one of the problems with sleeping on the roof of the Land Rover, you don't have any privacy anymore, um, but there was one little girl, maybe three, four years old. She decided she was going to adopt us. Or rather, she decided we were going to adopt her. Because she came with her mother. And um, as I was doing the fire and everything, she came and stood beside me and just took hold of my hand. And I was like, oh, okay. And then she copied everything I did. So when I poked the fire, she poked the fire. And when I went and sat down, she like sat down beside me I think and um, you know then uh, the people were getting bored because we weren't doing anything we'd eaten our meal we'd packed everything away we were sitting waiting to go to bed and so nothing was happening so this little girl's mother came along and and you know talked to her mother and, said, and the little one no 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 and she went to her mum she took my hand and she went to her mum bye 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 to her mum and shooed her mum away the thing okay you can go now I'm staying here you can go away. <laughs> like, uh, no, no, this is not what we came. We didn't come to Africa to adopt her. We didn't want to buy a rug in Morocco. We don't want to adopt a child in Mali. Certainly to take with us on the journey. But, uh, and it ended up that I had to walk the child back to her village, uh, which wasn't too far away. And, um, you know, she was happy to come with me and show her around. She showed me her house. And then I had to leave her in the house her mum grabbed hold of her and I had to run away. And you could hear her screaming, crying all the way back to my camp. She just wanted to go with these strange people for some unknown reason. So that was a very strange and a bit of a heartbreaking experience. It was, it was unusual. Anyway, I didn't adopt an African child. Then we continued along the road and uh, the road wasn't in brilliant condition. It was a bit better than the Road of Hope, but not a great deal better. It was slow going, partly because there was a lot to see, a lot to enjoy, but also because the condition of the road was... It wasn't four-wheel drive, it just you couldn't drive any speed. So there was potholes, goats in the road, no road, diversions. Uh, slow, slow going. So we're making our way across to the border. And uh, we miss time, though. there's a, a town uh, that we're planning to stay at. We don't arrive until the dark, um, it, it's, which is unfortunate. We always try and arrive in the light so we can find somewhere to camp and, uh, and keep away from people. But when you arrive in the dark, of course, you can't see the surroundings in the same way where it's safe to drive. So we rolled into this town and it's dark 
and it's, it's basically a transit town. I can't remember the name of it, it may not even have a name, it was such a small, small town on this road on the border to Niger, um, on the way to the border with Niger. So we rolled up at a place that looked like it might be a guest house or something of some kind, and um, outside the house is this huge lady sitting there. I mean, she is a big lady. And she's sitting in there, and she went, oh, um, ça va bien? You know, because French and Arabic are the two main languages for, for international communication there. And uh, she introduced herself. She says, I'm Madame Cigar, and I welcome you. And uh, we explained, well, we need somewhere to park the Land Rover and, and sleep, and, um, and we need some food. And, ah, Madame Cigar will help you. And um, she showed us around the back, and they had a yard where there's lots of other parked vehicles. Most of them broken and not working. And she said, you sleep here. I feed you. I feed you. Said, Perfect. This will do. We'll park the vehicle there. We go and sit with her on the front seat. And, um, and uh, she said, to eat, eat. Mange, mange. Oui, oui. And, uh, and, uh, poulet, poulet, which is chicken. We go, ah, oh, ça va, chicken, poulet, ça va bien. And, um, <laughs> she looks around and there's lots of chickens running around in front of her. And she looks... She picks one up, goes, breaks its neck, I cook! <laughs> and she starts plucking the chicken. <laughs> and so that was going to be our supper. So we weren't going to go to it that soon because she had to pluck the chicken and then cook it. And we were sitting basically just beside the road with the occasional truck coming by and all the people, as the trucks came back by, all the people at that village basically made their money by selling snacks and treats and things to the drivers that come through on the way um, to the border. So we were sort of entertained by this and um, there was a guy came along who is I think Madame Cigar's son and um, in in a lot of countries in Africa men hold hands. It, it, it's it's um, just a natural thing. So this guy came up to me, he's chatting to me, holds my hand, he says come, come. And um, he shows me around a bit of the village. I mean they've, they don't, it's not big enough to have a school but he is luring me somewhere with a purpose and this is a very important purpose because when I come what I had noticed that on the road all the people and all the people there selling were all girls and women there was not a man and he was the only man I'd seen apart from me um, came around the corner to the back of the village and suddenly find out where all the men are and they gathered around this tiny little television and a huge satellite dish. I mean, massive satellite dish. And at that time, Mali was playing in the Africa Cup of Nations and it was through to the finals. And they couldn't get reception to make the television work so the village could watch the football match. So as somebody came along, a person that might be able to help, they wanted me to help fix the dish and connect it to the TV so they could watch this football match. So I don't really know a great deal about those things, but I know some basics and I had tools which they didn't even have. So I got the toolkit from the Landy and we looked at how the cables were fixed in the back. We did got supplies, we did some makeshift repairs, we got some coat hangers. <laughs> we basically connected the two together and it worked. I have no idea how it worked, but it worked and they were so, so happy. So while my chicken dinner was being plucked and prepared and while Jennifer was sitting on the street surrounded by all these people selling stuff to the passing uh, truckers, I sat and watched Marley. Unfortunately, they didn't win. It was really, they were ahead and they played so well, but they didn't win. So it was really a great experience, but a big disappointment. But they didn't care. They had fun. We had a football match, international football match in the desert and... Uh, and made some great friends. Can't remember any of their names. It, uh, everyone came and hugged, and, and yeah, it was it was great fun. Another unique experience. Then I was back. My dinner was ready: chicken and chips, <laughs> sitting beside this dusty road with Madame Cigar, who just chuckled away. She's a lovely lady. Uh, these absolutely delicious, fresh cooked chicken and chips. They were really great. And uh, then we tucked onto our Land Rover, onto the roof, and had a great night's sleep. And uh, that was our last night in Mali. So it, uh, Mali is a beautiful country. It's not the easiest country to get around. 
Um, and yeah, it's the people are amazing there. They really are, and they really are stuck in the middle of Africa. They're just getting on with their own lives. Um, sort of happy in a lot of ways. There's not a lot of foreign interference and aid and things going in and spoiling and changing their lives. They're just getting on with their lives and they're happy. We should learn a lot from that. So then it was farewell to Mali and we were on to Gao and it was time to leave Mali and enter Niger, another country that before we did a diversion I'd never even heard of. Either Nigeria, no, it's not Nigeria, it's Niger. So next time, into Niger, Park Dubulve, lions, hippos, and paraffin lamps. <laughs>